Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, is this the first step toward legalizing pot? Jersey City becomes the first town in New Jersey where you can smoke marijuana openly under certain conditions, effective today. Companies are ready to compete for New Jersey's offshore wind business, but they're warning regulators to get moving before they lose federal tax breaks. That could cost ratepayers more. Monmouth University gets a major donation from the federal government. I'm on it right now. Let's see what it means. Plus, is a once thriving occupation on the verge of a shortage? And we're heading to the beach. It's the annual Sandcastle competition. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Mary Alice Williams has the day off. A bold move by Jersey City leaders today. Effective immediately, low-level marijuana charges will be downgraded, even dismissed. The move to decriminalize the drug has been a sticking point as the state slowly looks to legalize recreational use. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron has our story. Jake Hudnut is the new municipal prosecutor in Jersey City. He and the man who appointed him, Mayor Steve Fulop, have decided to get out in front of the marijuana debate. Effective today, they are decriminalizing it, allowing possession of small amounts and discreet use. We feel that while New Jersey is having the conversation about legalization, it is unfair to continue to burden people with um, misdemeanor or what New Jersey calls disorderly person offense. Uh, convictions and the collateral consequences that come with those convictions. Collateral consequences like losing a student loan, losing a driver's license, losing a job, being ineligible for public housing, having a criminal record, being deported. Hudnut says people of color are three times more likely to face marijuana prosecutions than whites who use marijuana just as much. So we're adding our voice to the conversation in New Jersey, and we're saying while New Jersey debates legalization, um, we are going to address the racial inequality of marijuana enforcement. And at the end of the day, I think we're going to save resources for Jersey City. Uh, prosecution is costly. Uh, it's estimated that prosecuting marijuana alone costs the state of New Jersey a billion dollars every 10 years. The policy is a directive to the city's 10 assistant prosecutors to use their discretion in deciding which cases to pursue. It's not a directive to the police. Hudnut says smoking in the home is fine, but selling pot on the street is still a felony. A Jersey City police officer told us privately it's going to be hard to determine where cops should draw the line enforcing the new policy. Hudnut says while Jersey City is the first municipality in the state to decriminalize, bigger cities elsewhere have done it. New York does do this, yes. Philadelphia does this. Uh, I believe Chicago does this. On Jersey City streets today, the new policy got mixed reviews. Marijuana is not harmful. You never have nobody dying from marijuana, to be honest. And it helps people with diabetes that if they're hungry, marijuana helps them eat and gives them appetite. I think it's a bad thing because marijuana is a drug. Some people look at it as though, oh no, it's from the earth, it's not a drug, but it is a drug. It, it alters your, your mind and changes your mood. I think it's a good thing. I mean, it's a victimless crime, so I don't smoke marijuana myself, but I don't see anything wrong with it. If you're near a child, it's not good for children's lungs. So Jersey City today became the first town in New Jersey to decriminalize marijuana. Whether that leads to full legalization statewide is still very much an open question. In Jersey City, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. New analysis is out on a controversial state tax incentive program, and it looks like both supporters and critics have been right about it. Rhonda Schaffler standing by with a look at the day's business news. Rhonda. 
Brianna, New Jersey's program of using tax credits to promote job growth is in need of some reform. That is the conclusion of an analysis by the Blaustein School at Rutgers University, which looked at the Grow NJ program administered by the New Jersey EDA. Over the past few years, the state approved awards totaling over $4.4 billion in potential tax credits, which was projected to create and or retain over 59,000 jobs in the state. The analysis looked at the annual per job cost of 214 of those tax incentive awards. The average cost is $5,589 per job per year. In Camden, the cost is even higher, $34,000 per job per year. The analysis also found 70% of all of the awards went to companies in the northern part of the state. The report recommends several changes to the program, including reforming bonus policies that allow companies to get more generous tax breaks. New Jersey companies have created more than 42,000 new jobs in the past year. According to preliminary estimates from the federal government, there was a slight blip to that upward trend last month when the state lost 500 jobs. But New Jersey's unemployment rate fell slightly to 4.3 percent. It does remain worse than the national average of 4 percent. Small business was celebrated in Newark yesterday at an event held by the Rutgers University Center for Urban Entrepreneurship. This year, the group is marking its 10th anniversary of helping to create new jobs. We've assisted over 400 entrepreneurs now. They're generating over $138 million of annual revenue in our state every year. They employ over 600 people. These are the entrepreneurs that people don't think of as anchor institutions, but they are contributing to the Little League baseball teams and paying taxes and helping our state's economy and revitalizing our cities. The Rutgers Group announced a new council of entrepreneurs who will assist a new crop of budding businessmen and women. There's been another cyber attack on a healthcare company. Medical testing giant LabCorp is dealing with a ransomware attack that began a few days ago and has continued to spread. LabCorp provides lab testing for patients at numerous locations in New Jersey. The company says it has not detected any theft of its data. Ford has announced a recall of more than a half million fusions and escapes because of a problem that could cause the vehicles to roll away after being shifted into park. The recall covers fusions in the model years 2013 through 2016 and escapes in the model years 2013 and 2014. On Wall Street today, stocks retreated. The Dow fell 135 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. A new labor contract for roughly 6,500 state workers. Governor Murphy today striking a $34 million deal with the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, otherwise known as AFSCME, New Jersey Council 63. It includes two 2% 2 across the board raises for workers, among other benefits. It's also the second public worker deal Murphy struck since taking office. He calls it responsible and fair. Republicans, on the other hand, are criticizing the agreement as bad for taxpayers. Organized labor campaigned and donated heavily during Murphy's election. In the latest of what's become a string of lawsuits against the federal government, State Attorney General Gerbeer Graywall today announcing a suit against the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The dispute is over a decision to suspend a rule meant to limit the number of trucks known as gliders. These are heavy-duty trucks with newer bodies but older engines that don't meet current emission standards. The rules limited the production of these super polluters to 300 per manufacturer per year. Graywall says the EPA failed to give data for its decision and violated its own rules. New Jersey joins 15 other states in the lawsuit. Well, the state has an ambitious renewable energy goal, developing 3,500 megawatts of offshore wind capacity over the next decade. But narrowing down the firms that will build it and how utility customers will pay for it may have the project stalled before it takes off. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. 
When offshore wind turbines crank out juice, how will that energy get to shore and distributed to rate paying customers? The battle over those electric transmission rights erupted at a public hearing on how to set up New Jersey's barely born offshore wind industry. It's a critical issue. It's kind of like if you bought a piano and they delivered it to your front lawn, congratulations, you have a piano but you need it in your living room where you can play it. The controversy arose as companies with offshore leases prepared a bid on building New Jersey's first wind farms. Orsted just launched a data-gathering test buoy to find the best spot 10 miles off Atlantic City. But these firms also warned the Board of Public Utilities they won't bid unless they can run their own transmission lines to deliver the power they generate. Deepwater Wind explained it doesn't want its megawatts stranded offshore because another company's cable failed. That it's much safer, much more productive, uh, much better to actually have the developer control the full uh, package of the project from transmission to generation uh, all the way to uh, getting the, the power to the market. The problem? Other companies that specialize in building transmission lines also want the ability to bid. They're currently ineligible by law because they don't also generate wind power. We're the folks that have built these projects like offshore wind transmission on budget and on time. We should be able to compete. This prohibition on an entire category of companies from simply bidding just makes no sense. Stakeholders testified on the record for the BPU, which is working feverishly to establish guidelines for bidding on New Jersey's first 1,100 megawatts of offshore power and determine how much it'll cost New Jersey ratepayers. The solicitation should allow developers to bid up to the full 1,100 megawatts and to supply multiple bids. Ultimately, allowing multiple and large-scale bids will provide the BPU the opportunity to determine the optimal project size for the state and for ratepayers. It's a complex process. Advocates urged rules to protect the environment and to shield ratepayers who will shoulder the burden of paying for offshore wind energy development, which Governor Murphy ordered should hit 3,500 megawatts by 2030. Please consider the customers who are going to be paying for this and give them time to absorb those costs. For now, time's in short supply. Everyone agreed bids must occur before federal investment tax credits expire in 2019. This investment tax credit is worth roughly 12 percent of the capital cost of the wind farm, which represents a potential cost savings for New Jersey ratepayers of hundreds of millions of dollars, and that is scheduled to phase out in 2019. The BPU will have more public hearings. It's got more regulatory hoops to jump through. Developers say they hope delays don't take the wind out of their sails. In West Windsor, I'm Brenda Flanagan and JTV News. A case where demand is outpacing supply. This isn't about goods, though. It's nurses, the healthcare professionals we rely on for medical needs in our hospitals, doctors' offices, or specialty clinics. As Leah Mishkin reports, the state is on track to have one of the largest shortages in the country. When your dad, your mom, and two of your sisters are all nurses, odds are good that you're also going to join the field. Anna Onday enrolled in the nursing school at William Patterson University. I volunteered at my parents' uh, work where I got to interact with the patients a lot and I realized that I really loved helping people. Her family all share her passion for nursing, so they worry about more and more nurses retiring. They're all around the same age and they need like new nurses to come in to take their place. According to the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration, New Jersey will have the third largest nurse shortage in the country by 2030, a shortage of more than 11,000. With the past recession, nurses uh, were putting off retiring, so they stayed in the workforce a little bit longer. Now with an uptick in the economy, they're beginning to um, retire and uh, phase out of the career, and so that's what's bringing us forward to an upcoming nursing shortage. The problem isn't getting a new generation to want to fill the demand. These kids are coming in such as ourselves. We all have this passion to help people. The source of the crisis is the fact that schools of nursing are having their faculty age out as well, which means schools across the country are not able to take in as many students. We're turning away qualified applicants in droves because we don't have enough faculty to educate them. Numbers from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing say in 2017, more than 56,000 qualified applications were rejected from undergraduate nursing programs across the country. 
baby boomer nurses are retiring, faculty are aging out. Many schools of nursing can't take in large classes due to faculty restrictions. And the chair of the nursing department at William Patterson University says it's a challenge to recruit new faculty. You would have to have a master's or a doctoral degree, so you're, you're recruiting from a small, smaller pool of nurses. Um, and because of the disparity in salary between clinical work and academic work, um, unfortunately there's not always um, as much incentive to move into academic. So it's just going to get worse and worse? It's going to get worse and worse, absolutely. It's a big problem. This is why um, we need to look into um, federal grants and other uh, financial resources so that we can not only support students through scholarships and other incentives to go to nursing school, but that we can encourage uh, nurses to go back and obtain higher degrees in nursing so that they can become nurse practitioners or nurse faculty. The crisis is something these nursing students say they think about and it motivates them to work even harder. We want to be hands on, we want to help our patients. It's not necessarily necessarily because of the shortage, but I guess in a way you do feel more responsibility to maybe even fill in the areas that are needed more than other areas. The president of New Jersey State Nurses Association says there are currently two branches that are highly impacted in terms of the shortage, labor and delivery and the operating room. Anna Onde wants to make an impact on the delivery floor. In Wayne, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Why has LeBron James been hanging around a New Jersey high school basketball team? That tops tonight's Garden State Express, our first stop, Newark, where the basketball star and production company owner pointed his camera lens at Newark Central High. His eight-part original YouTube docuseries called Best Shot launches this week. It follows the Newark Central boys basketball team as they chase the school's first state championship, along with their inspiring journey rising above the challenges and conflicts they face on and off the court in Brick City. Next to Camden, vacant lots and blighted areas are a trouble spot for inner cities. In this case, though, it's the very reason Camden may receive up to a million dollars. The city is one of 14 across the nation in the running for a public art challenge through Bloomberg Philanthropies. Camden's proposal would transform several lots littered with illegal dumping near the Patco line, creating instead a plaza with sculptures and art projects that reflect the history of the city. Cooper's Ferry Park Partnership and Rutgers Camden Center for the Arts are also in on the collaboration. Three winners will be selected in the fall. Fingers crossed. Finally, Belmar, and we love this time of year. The sand sculptures never disappoint, and clearly they don't for the other roughly 10,000 who showed up for the annual New Jersey Sandcastle competition. The creativity just gets better every year. This time it was giant sea creatures, the Flintstones, movie characters. The imagination is really on display with how contestants make these ideas come to life. They use shovels and buckets, but also sculptures sculpting tools, even food coloring. 15 trophies were awarded, but it was the group of guys from Seaside Heights who go by the Bikini Boys, who once again took home top prize. Best on the beach for their Etch-a-Dragon sculpture. If only there were a way to keep the tide from coming. And that's our Garden State Express for Thursday, July 19th, 2018. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. In 1993, philanthropist Walter Annenberg gifted $100 million to one of the state's top boarding schools near Princeton. It catapulted the then little-known tucked-away 500-student institution known as the Petty School to among the nation's elite, and in the 25 years since, diversified the student body, affording high schoolers from all backgrounds and economic means the financial aid necessary to attend. Andrew Schmertz has the story. As one of the priciest and most exclusive prep schools in America, Petty School in Heightstown says the $100 million donation has been essential in attracting students of all economic backgrounds. Peter Quinn is the school's headmaster. At the time of the gift in 1993, we decided that the standards for choosing students would be this new standard of excitement, curiosity, and character. Because of the gift, was we said, all right, we're going to look for excitement, curiosity, and character, and that's going to be the only thing these kids have in common. 
right? So when you look at the student body, they won't look like each other. They won't come from the same zip codes. They won't think the same things about uh, religion or about politics or about a whole range of life contexts, but they will have this excitement, curiosity, and character in common. It's the 25th anniversary of the donation by media giant Walter Annenberg. Annenberg was the owner of the Philadelphia Inquirer, TV Guide, and numerous broadcast properties during the heyday of the publishing industry. The late ambassador to the UK, who graduated from the Petty School in 1927, spent his later years giving away $2 billion to institutions he felt a close connection to. Today, that $100 million donation to Petty has grown to over 300 million. It has paid dividends in giving us a racially diverse student body, a politically diverse student body, socioeconomically diverse student body, geographically diverse student body. Annenberg specifically wanted his money to go to help fund scholarships for students who otherwise could not afford to attend the prep school. Boarding school tuition is as high as $58,000 a year here, and 40% of the students are on some financial aid. That would not have been possible, the school says, without the gift from Annenberg. Christian Rodriguez graduated this past June. Without a scholarship, he says this is a school his parents could never have thought about. It's definitely not a place where every single person is coming from the highest income, like families. But I, for me, my family does well. I'm super grateful that my parents are able to pay what they have to pay for me to come here, even with the gift. But there are so many different people from so many different backgrounds, and it really helps those who come from people, like families that don't have the money and some families that do have the money, and everyone just kind of gets their own perspective and just become one kind of family as a class. Including international students, the school says about 40 percent of its student body is from diverse backgrounds, a number that has grown over 25 years as the endowment has grown as well. In Heightstown, Andrew Schmertz, NJTV News. A traditional classroom is probably not the ideal location to study marine biology, but a classroom on board Monmouth University's new state-of-the-art research vessel? That'll do. Michael Hill reports. The view from the NAVU on the Navasink River, the 49-foot NAVU, is Monmouth University, Urban Coast Institute's newest acquisition, a donation from one of the Institute's collaborators, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. We are really thrilled to be able to support Monmouth University in their expanding marine science research program. The NAVU has undergone major maintenance and improvement. It now has state-of-the-art technologies, enabling highly detailed views of underwater terrains, overnight research on the water, and research much farther from shore than the school's two other smaller vessels. We like to say part of the reason that the Monmouth Urban Coast Institute was founded is that we have an ideal laboratory in this region to study any number of issues, coastal pollution, uh, issues having to do with beach management, issues having to do with siting offshore wind farms, uh, navigation, any number of issues. So this is your laboratory, and we like to say our, our, at Monmouth, this is our coast, but this is your horizon. We all share this in common, and now with this vessel, we'll all be able to explore that, research that. The phrase used over and over again about this vessel is how it will expand this university's research on the water and in the water actually do oceanographic cruise work and hands-on authentic science with students in, in a format that we couldn't do before. So this vessel opens up tremendous opportunities. And in previous years, we'd have to split up the classes to go out, um, but now we can really take advantage of our full class periods and we'll be able to do like um, more substantial sampling and we can probably also like analyze our samples on the boat um, with a, uh, like our endowed professor, Jason Adolph, when he's doing the phytoplankton. Um, we won't have to like take it back to the lab. We now have the space and the equipment to analyze it um, in the field. Professor Jason Adolph demonstrated some of his research, collecting samples to measure water quality and find out what's in the Navasink. The students and marine scientists examined what they captured. Oh, we do have a fish in there. Yeah. yeah. Is that a fish or? Get Keith, quick. What kind of fish is that? <laughs> it looks like a, uh, <laughs> there's a, piece of a long skinny Dolphin. thing. That looks like, yes. oh, there's a little crab. Long skinny one's a northern pipefish. 
The NAVA will enable Professor Keith Dunn to expand his research and tracking of coastal sharks and the endangered Atlantic sturgeon through acoustic tagging. This is an easy pass system for fish. So as the fish sims by this receiver, its time, date uh, gets stamped. Uh, these tags can also be coded to tell us what depth the fish is at, what temperature the fish is at. Dunton says it's information to help set policy that protects marine life. The university says what the NAVA will allow researchers to do seems almost without limits. This boat is such a game changer that we already have other universities in the area who are asking to be able to utilize the boat for their research and we certainly plan on partnering with them to do so. Generosity spawning generosity. Aboard the NAVU, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Jersey City is the first municipality in the state to decriminalize marijuana possession. 42% of New Jersey residents support fully legalizing pot, according to a poll by FDU. There are currently no offshore wind turbines in New Jersey, and the state's unemployment rate is 4.3%. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, finding EPA rollbacks. To share any story you've seen tonight, Go to njtvnews.org. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.